there's a saying that says sustainability is an idea ahead of its time because you can't sustain where we're at now it's not the bar needs to come up so we need to go on that regenerative path to get ourselves back into functioning systems free of synthetics there's a countless reasons why we could talk about the toxicity in our environment not being a soil literally underpins all of that whether it be our environmental health, our biodiversity health, our natural habitat, our wildlife, our food systems, our recreation systems. Welcome to the Bailiwick Express podcast. My name is Kit Hanna. We'll be joined each week by a guest for a series of podcasts. Each will shine a light on topics from across the Bailiwick. We'll have reviews, hot seat interviews and special guests. So stick with us as we offer some insight on some of the most important issues we in the Bailiwick face. The quality of food is only as good as the soil it grows in. And for decades, the Earth's black gold has been degenerated through intensive farming practices. Everything from petroleum-based fertilisers Monocropping and the fuel required to operate farm machinery has served to harm our environment and produce sub-optimal food. But Jock Pettit, a self-proclaimed soil farmer, believes the mainstream methods of farming are not inevitable, promoting instead small-scale, widespread and community-centred organic farming. He believes this can positively affect the environment in which we grow and even provide greater flavour and nutrition from the produce. Express sat down with Mr Pettit to learn all about regenerative farming, the issues facing Guernsey's growing industry, and what makes soil great. So first of all, I want to start off with, what exactly is soil? Good question. Um, the, most people, including me, before I started diving deeper into the subject, saw soil as the stuff I was stood on, you know, the brown surface, different colours of brown and the dark, you know, that idea of it looks healthier, it doesn't. And it was only when I started to look at nutrient density of food and healthy food that it caused me to go on a pretty deep wormhole of a journey, literally, mm -hmm. on discovering what the composition of soil is, why it's important, how it functions. And to answer your question specifically, soil is essentially made up of five things. There's a mineral element, which is the rocks and silicate. And there is an organic matter, which is whether that's manure or whether that's leaf litter or bits of timber and nature's process of breaking down, right? So the organic matter and the mineral are the first two. And then there is air, aeration, really important in soil. Uh, water, water content, really a, a part of a makeup of soil. And the final, com fi final component of those five is um, living biology. And if you're looking for a definition, soil is made up of those five things in balance. But without the living biology, if you take that part away, you're talking about dirt. Mm. And so there's a definition of to achieve the word soil, one needs to have life in it. Mm. And when you then look at the function of how it's really important that those five elements are there, but also they're in balance. Too much water, it's waterlogged, it's no longer got air in it, so it's anaerobic and it's not a so And also that heavy water will very, much, very quickly change the biological balance. Um, and therefore what's possible, which plants will thrive, much fewer. Um, so for functioning soil, and we can get into, I'm sure, in the dialogue, which plants, where, succession, and all these kind of things, but keeping it just for a moment on soil, it's really important to find balance, and the balance then determines the healthy function of the soil. So important to have aeration, important to have water all in balance, and the biology's function then is really in part creating some of that organic matter through their normal bodily function. <laughs> um, but mining the minerals and turning them into a plant soluble, trying to stay accessible here, but mining the minerals and through successive animal function, leaving them in the soil in a plant soluble format. Mm. So it's essentially creating a nutrient buffet <laughs> yes. for a plant in a format that the roots can tap into. And we can go a little deeper on that as well, because the root is quite a crude instrument. So yes. there's a further function there. Um, so yeah, in essence, soil is five things. It's uh, mineral, organic matter, air, water, and living biology. And what are the consequences for any plant 
if there, these imbalances exist in the soil that you're growing in? There's, um, there's, there's a lot of consequences. Um, nature doesn't do simple, it does complex. Um, so there are so many ways to answer that question, but let's go for some simple examples. Um, ultimately, plants need to tap into, like we do, tap into a range of nutrients in any given moment to support their healthy function, their growth, their disease resistance, resilience, um, different stages even. Um, in the spring, everything's about blossoming and producing and then uh, growing and supporting a fruit, perhaps. Or, and in the winter, it's all about retracting and pulling everything back down into the root system, preparing for the next season. So there's that seasonal rhythm, and a plant needs different things right the way through that process. Um, so if you haven't, how does it support the function? Well, first of all, if the biology is missing for one of many reasons, um, if, if your land management practice and plowing hard every year and taking away and not putting back or leaving soil bare or not having living root systems in it, um, all of these negatively impact the biological um, populations that it dwell in soil. And without that biology, it's not mining the minerals and making it available to the plants. The plant is now deficient. It can't access what it wants when it wants it. And this creates a situation where everything works in cycles. In, and if you stand back and leave a naturally functioning system, that cycle will just play out the nutrient cycle of the, the biology, mining the mineral, giving it to the plant. And there's an exchange that happens there, whereas the, the biology underground can't access sugars, essentially, from its current resource base. And the plant is the one that delivers that into the system, transferring sunlight through photosynthesis into sugars, some of which it uses for its own needs, and the rest it puts out through its root system. It's called exudates, but essentially sugars, which invite the, the right breadth and diversity of biology to inhabit its root system, create a colony there, so that the two can now have a symbiotic relationship of sharing resource. The, uh, so without biology the plant can't feed efficiently and effectively and keep itself healthy and without the plant the biology can't feed mm. so it's an interdependent <laughs> system then absolutely and if you take uh, we come along as humans with all our um nature it's not that nature has a really steady never changes path uh, one certainty in nature has changed but it happens on quite a slow rhythmic scale so systems adjust as humans, we, with all our intelligence, we come along and understand systems and intervene. So we created the plough, and we turn that soil over and over and over, year on year, and, and, and what we choose to do with it and put back into it, through our own wisdom and experience, we find over time we're depleting that environment year on year on year because we're not now maintaining the balance necessary for that soil ecosystem to thrive the same when we then come along particularly after world war ii with our synthetics and we choose to feed the plant or attack the, the pest mm. or the disease and these things typically come about because we moved away from diversity in our farming small scale diverse multi-input multi-output systems and went for monocrop mm. systems and you put a monocrop in place and a pest thinks happy days <laughs> Look at that, easy target. Um, and so then increasingly we have to work harder and harder to maintain the status. And the more we put in the pesticide or the herbicide, and all, the more we diminish the biological function and the biological population, the more exposed the plant is and the more we have to do next year to sustain that same point. So it's a degenerative cycle. And this is why you see in... in, in the news increasingly and, and you'll read more and more often now about desertification mm. being uh, as essentially that degenerative process reaching an end game of devoid of function um you'll see water too much not enough the soil losing its ability to hold on to water or to manage water efficiently in its loamy 
state. There's a, there's a data point that will qualify that that says for every 1% increase of organic matter per acre, the soil can hold an additional 20,000 litres of water. And when the soil is holding that water in a functional, balanced way, plants can tap into it, not just when it rains, but on a longer, more balanced time frame. When the soil has no ability to hold on to that water, one, it creates runoff, which takes organic matter and mineral and nutrient with it, so you're depleting the soil again. Mm. Two, it creates problems downstream wherever that's going, especially if you've been using synthetics on the land because it takes it with it, and that now ends up in the water course and affecting your neighbour or the stream or the, the, the life there too. And the... It takes a lot of work then, or it certainly takes a body of work to try and get that balance back into the system so it can maintain itself. So with our wisdom of intervention, there are often unintended, and it's not a blame game, it's just a, we didn't know probably. Mm. You know, I look at my granddad as a farmer and some of the decisions he was probably making in the way that he changed his farming practices. And we know a lot more now. And the, uh, the question for me is, now we know, and when we do know, do we change? Mm, absolutely. Do we respond to what we know? I think that's the. I think it's imperative that we do. How responsive globally do you think farmers, governments, organisations are to the need to establish regenerative practices after decades of these regenerative practices? I think. Again. I wish the answers to these questions were, were so simple because one would then expect the change to follow quite quickly. Um, and in simple terms, uh, my dad always used to say, if you reduce the, the earth down to 100 people, modelling that is really easy, right? Because mm. you know everyone and you can have sensible conversations and everything, pragmatism and common sense should prevail. We we operate in increasingly complex political, geopolitical, country, commercial. And so there are so many different paymasters, if you like, that we have to attend to in the current system that it's hard to answer that in anything other than a purist view and then try and take that view and apply it to the real world. Mm. I'll have a go. Um, I don't think it's yet at the government scale that you're going to see this change. There Why are is that? Complexity. Well, uh, I mean, how political do you want to get? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's up to you. <clears throat> I'll tread carefully. Um, politics is inherently complicated. It's trying to serve everybody with a solution or a range of solutions. So it's that kind of one solution fits all to a degree with variables and it's hard to do that it's hard to balance the books it's you know i often think guernsey's quite an interesting case study in that regard because as a small community we are more autonomous and more um agile if you like still relatively conservative i suppose but if you compare us to a population in a similar size uk town who don't have anything like the same governance autonomy infrastructure harbour airport i think our pound goes a pretty long way in providing an infrastructure here. And therefore, I think small nation states have real opportunity to lead the way in some of the change that's necessary in the world to showcase and blueprint. I think there's a real opportunity there. Um, but governments, I don't think, are necessarily best placed on the larger scale to be the forerunners in this. I mean, ultimately, what do we employ a government to do? It's a fairly risk-averse <laughs> environment, right? Um, but the innovation is there nonetheless, and I think it's actually happening more amongst communities who have asked different questions of what they want from the system. Farmers who, especially new generation farmers who are coming in and seeing global situations unfold and asking different questions and looking at the reality of what they're doing and saying, you know, asking those deeper questions. and. One of the things I've found most beautiful about the regenerative farming community, if you like, globally, is that it's not a protective environment. It's so open doors. Everyone's sharing knowledge and information. It's very much a, a collective movement that's growing through sharing. 
um, rather than a, an IP protective environment that we're used to seeing in the commercial world. Um, my gains are something I will tell, especially in other jurisdictions, learn from what we're doing, we learn from what you're doing. Um, and I think that has the potential to spread it further and faster. It's not the typical top-down hierarchy system, and I think that's, again, really beneficial to the potential for it to become more widespread. But I think there's also a challenge to that in that you can't monocrop a regenerative system. You can't do 10,000 acres of corn and make it viable in that, held up against that lens. Um, it necessitates diversity. And therefore, smaller scale, diverse farming where the inputs of one system are the outputs of the, of the other and low fuel, low carbon input, zero synthetic input, using the natural resilience and biology and working to reinforce and, and, and care for those so that they feed back to you. And ultimately, that's the delivery agent. That's the that system in balance is what puts nutrient in the food. Nutrient in the food is what puts health and energy into us. And if you are, how I came to this conversation myself over the last 12, 15 years, why I've been asking this question, why am I even here, is that first question of questioning what the food system and what I'm engaging with. And a pursuit to try and improve that has been a thousand questions. It's, it's not a cliff edge. Mm. <laughs> Wake up in the morning and do it differently. It's been a thousand different questions that arrive you at a, a learning journey that brings me to the point of trying to, in our small community setting, and it turns out actually that's probably one of the most relevant settings we could work in. It would be harder and it, whether in the U.S. perhaps. That we, there are significant practitioners in this space in the U.S., but where it's typical to have a 20,000 acre farm. Yes. You know, farms bigger than Guernsey. And um, mass government subsidies. Well, the, subsidies are a really interesting point, actually. I don't think, as with all of this, we could go a thousand ways. Subsidy in farming. Why are we subsidizing farming? Why, you know, why is them? why are we having to prop it up? And there's a number of answers to that. But one of the, if you just look at it objectively, you've got to say it's not washing its face, and why not? Why isn't? And are we paying the true cost of fuel at the pump? You know, all these kind of questions, and yet that a, lot, a lot of intensive farming is very fuel-heavy. Mm. And it's not, a, it's not an uncommon story to see that a farming system is not viable because of the cost of fuel and synthetics <laughs> are going up and up and up. Oh, funny, there are systems of farming that don't require either of those things mm. in any certainly no synthetics but minimal fuel and so it's the question of viability of farming in what manner i think the un has also stated that in recent years that small scale local diverse farming is very likely the future of farming in terms of feeding the world there's a conversation about waste throughout the system that we could talk about as to whether we're achieving the numbers as well because it's often lauded that the scale farming is the only way to get the numbers to feed the world and I, I think there's other ways of looking at that challenge. But subsidy in farming? There are certainly numerous examples globally of small-scale, diverse local farming attending to regenerative practice, free of synthetics, lifestyle-driven, community relevant low food miles type projects being pr very profitable and i suppose you could put yourself in that category you have set up a soil farm you've achieved success uh i've seen your products across the island um so how exactly did you become a soil farmer you mentioned your father was a farmer himself and you said uh, about 10 to 12 years ago you had sort of a, a realization or came to an understanding what what, what was the sort of catalyst for all of this? My father grew up on a farm. Um, he chose not to be a farmer. Ah. He, he grew up on a pig farm. That was my grandfather's. And they also grew potatoes and, and a range of other things, but predominantly they were a pig farm. And that was already back then farmers becoming narrower in their output. Um, 
and uh, I remember getting a black eye from a huge clod of grey earth and looking back now I bet that earth didn't have much life in it that's why it was such a rock when it, mm. <laughs> my grandfather um, playfully lobbed a lump of earth in me, <laughs> a big chunk of dirt um, why did I get into it? well I guess for all of us there comes that point in life where we realise or certainly for me where I realised I wasn't immortal um, partly thinking about kids and that transition to that stage of life and I recognize that if I look back at my own journey in this subject as a student living opposite a 24-hour petrol station that used to probably buy an unhealthy share of my food from that shop I wasn't making choices around food and yet I'd grown up with a family and farming with my parents owned a hotel and a residential home at different stages and so there were three course meals I was always closely associated with food and my mum cooked a lot so it wasn't a convenience food environment I grew up in but whilst I had food around I wasn't asking questions of the nutrition in it of really questioning its health and energy function I was just looking at it as a uh, enjoyable engagement with flavour um, and lucky to have a mum that, that did a lot of home cooking and it was only then when I started to reconnect with that that an iterative journey started of that thousand questions of the first step being, well, what if I put some food in my back garden? And there started the learning. It worked or it didn't work or the bugs came or the, the watering schedule was crazy during the summer. And I wasn't yet aware of why the soil wasn't holding water or why these things were happening. But the questions were being asked. And yeah. So my nature is that one then goes on down that wormhole and finds out how to, and encouraging friends to get involved scaling from a back garden project that I kind of very quickly realised wasn't time viable unless this is just a hobby if I'm going to make a meaningful difference what if we rent some space and get three or four or five families together and we all take a day of the week each and that reduces the load in watering and what have you And we, so we did that a few times a few different iteration, iterations learnt some stuff um load more questions ended up trying to through edible guernsey creating a, a fa the, the basis of a community farming model which was founded on the question of how do you feed this is the point i got to was how do you feed sixty five thousand people population of guernsey the highest quality locally produced food for free and the reason for Coin, uh, to, to find, kind of arriving at that question was that I didn't think you could change the food system which I increasingly perceived and still hold the view is, is, is broken um, our relationship with food our supply chains are the more that corporations and huge businesses involved in food and it's about profit and money rather than about the end product the more that's the case, I think the food system is broken and, and efforts to try and polish that by 1% or 2% to improve it, I didn't see as viable for changing the system I was seeing. You know, So for me, it was like, well, then what if you start with a blank page and we take all our collective knowledge and intelligence and community and all these other resources that we have and were to ask the question of what should food look like? How do we do it? What do we do? And if you can start with that basis, then we've got a chance of asking different questions and coming up with different solutions. And ultimately, as I suggested before, when you see regenerative um, farming principles, they're very different to the current conventional. And that's that kind of start again thinking or actually look further back <laughs> past the advent of the, the post-World War uh, synthetic influence on farming and increasingly machine and fuel and scale oriented we can learn something even from as early as introducing the plough which was humans settling and producing grain there's a really interesting book that I, I haven't read but I've read the, the cover on it that talks about wheat um, domesticating humans yes <laughs> yes that's a great story I think that's um Yuval Noah Harai. Yes. yes, I've read some of his books and he, have, he alludes to that, but I think there's some further reading on that in a more deep way. But I think that's a really interesting notion mm. that wheat is this alien species that harnessed us yes. <laughs> for its own ends. Yes. 
I don't know. I think that's quite... Yeah, it's a great way to look at it, isn't it? Yeah, and I think, you know, um, the scale of of that farming, of the, of the current farming model, where the solutions might lie looking very different, that blank page is really important to rethink the system. Whether one applies that in its purest sense as where you arrive at, but certainly what we were trying to do with that question was blank page and ask, how do we get the cost point, the local, the productivity, the nutrient, how do you re- and ultimately that project in terms of answering the question wasn't a success, but you often learn more in failing to do something and going the hard route through it than you do in successful outcome and where the successes were in that project particularly with the social outcomes of bringing people together mm. around food which food's always been doing um so there's some amazing social and community outcomes but there was a point at which there was some resistance in the system we've always done it this way or, or people having different ideas and ultimately where i got to is i felt that i needed to streamline again and really focus in and so exited that project which is still running, um, but exited that, having gotten to the point where I'd learned the questions I'd asked had pointed so frequently and so often at soil, and I kind of had this realization from my lens at least that without healthy functioning soil, we're going nowhere. And actually the problem you see in the world is yours to solve, a mantra we'd been asking right the way through the journey, okay, well, let's focus right in on what we do to address the issues of healthy soil in our community to underpin all activity, whether it's food-related or landscape-related and environment and biodiversity-related, all of them. Are, you need the environment and biodiversity to have a healthy food system. It can't operate in isolation. Yes. So we came and focused really hard there, studied a lot, still studying, um, but got to ourselves to the point where our knowledge and our abilities to apply essentially farm and reapply biology back into landscapes in balance with amendments in mineral, organic matter, and developing and working with those systems such that the aeration and the water sits in balance. So we come back to that, what soil? Ultimately, we have arrived at a point where we are working to restore balance in soil systems. And if you consider it like a flywheel, it needs a certain amount of impetus to get past the initial friction stage to get that flywheel turning, which is a big, heavy, slow-moving instrument. But once you get it turning, it pretty much turns by itself. Good to hear. And so that's part of our processes where, and this, uh, this nods again to the, the money and the corporation in food. Ultimately, if our business model is successful, we design ourselves out of the system, which isn't a great business model if you're looking for, you know, for pure financial gain. But I think there's so many more layers that, we're look that you can gain back from that system. Um, and ultimately, as well, if you look at it from a food perspective, you're taking out the system. So we have to design in some element of how you then manage the waste and the other environmental resources in that system to put them back in, such that the regenerative outcome rather than the degenerative outcome, as in the land is improving or gaining function year on year. Um, so that's essentially the, the, the purpose of what we try and do is work with work with land managers, food producers, large and small, to redefine the cyclic systems that get them there's a saying that says sustainability is an idea ahead of its time because you can't sustain where we're at now, it's not the bar needs to come up. So we need to go on that regenerative path to get ourselves back into functioning systems free of synthetics there's a countless reasons why we could talk about the toxicity in our environment not being a, a good place to be and soil literally underpins all of that 
whether it be our environmental health, our biodiversity health, our natural habitat, our wildlife, our food systems, our recreation systems. It, it, it all needs addressing. So we have a, a model of every square inch. <laughs> That's our objective. So there's a lot of work to do. What have you discovered in Guernsey? What, what is the situation here in terms of farming, regenerative practices? I note that your business also does soil testing, so you can actually measure the nutrient content. What, what have you found in Guernsey? Is there cause for concern in some of our agricultural fields? Again, it's a complex, it's a complex space. We're dealing with people, we're dealing with livelihoods, we're dealing with landscapes, we're dealing with communities, we're dealing with apathy in the consumer decision-making. You know, how far down the sourcing of our food do we really ask questions? It's worth stating there, actually, that I think the pound is one of the best votes we have. Um, because every time you engage with the food system, you can vote for how you want your farmer to work or how you want your land to be looked after. And apathy at that point will support systems that are more commercially driven. And if you were to lift the lid slightly on the packaging, that's very carefully, I mean, let's not escape the point that the marketing and packaging in food is designed to sell you stuff that's not necessarily aligned for your health or energy. There's, there's commercial people <laughs> and interests in food. So if it was as pure as the blank, you know, as the, it's an apple. <laughs> but the moment, and, and particularly having conversations with people recently about veganism, <clears throat> there is massive commercial opportunity in making product in that sector that will be more about money. That's not to say anything about the veganism, about plant-based food, hugely healthy outcomes. Healthy, nutritious, plant-based food should form a huge, in my view, should form a, a large part of a diet. I have been completely meat-free at times. I'm currently small amounts of highest quality meat, a lot of plant-based food. But my, my point is that it's, the, it's the, the corporation and the profit in the food system that's the risk. So bringing that back to your question on in the local context, what have we found? <clears throat> Excuse me. Testing is really, really important at first level of engagement because it gives you data. And whilst we can read the environmental conditions of a landscape and make some assessments and judgment calls of what you're going to find in the soil, plants and natural environment will tell you as indicators that the testing is really important to determine some data and a baseline on what are the pH levels, what are the organic matter levels, are the nutrients there but locked up, are they freely available, are they in abundance, what is the biology profile, do you have the full successive bacterial through the nutrient cyclers of the protozoa and amoeba and the flagellates and do you have the mycorrhizal fungi and the, the arthropods and the nematodes do you have all of these populations of different biology in the appropriate balance and bringing that slightly human element back onto it aligned to what we want the outcome of that land to be because a very grassland environment is different to an orchard is different to a forest is different to a food producing system in terms of what you will want in that balanced biology so we can steer it a little bit it's not to say that you just have to walk away and leave everything to go back to nature um, but we can work in a much more sensitive way with the landscape. And so data is really, really important to tell us where we're at. And arguably, you know, it's just, it's very typical working with local land managers. You come along to us and say, I'm trying to, my orchard's not doing very well. I've planted this half acre of orchard out the back of my house and I'm not getting the plant, you know, there's some disease, there's not great yield, growth isn't great, what, let's have a look at what's going on and we find that the environment you're planting your orchard in is really low successional environment quite bacterial rather than the fungal environment the trees are going to want to be thriving in and the biology is not creating the nutrient profile that the tree is looking for and the photosynthesis that's happening in, in sunlight conversion is enough to build the structure of the tree but not enough to fulfill its nutrient needs to 
produce optimum fruit or even fruit, yield in volume, but then yield in volume with nutrient density. So there is this optimization of, okay, well, what, what do we need to know, first of all, to identify where the problem is? And then how do we design the introduction of mineral supplement, perhaps in the short term, while that flywheel is starting to be turned? What's the biological shift in, in, bio, in living biology that we need to do? What, what root systems can we introduce in complementary planting around the tree that are pulling the soil biology and feeding and building that resident relationship where the tree and the surrounding planting are working in the same direction? Because grass being in a different direction, surrounding your orchards in grass is creating a pull in two different directions. So it's, it's the data is really important. What we found in the local community is that there are lots of people looking to so, from their personal inquiry looking to attend to environmental narratives and, and improve their relationship with land or to make the land surrounding their home um, healthier, more functioning. There are farming... I mean... It, there are farmers are also asking really important and valuable questions. The, one of the points I, I will say is that from a scale of farming in Guernsey, it, from a food security or a percentage on the plate, it's really, really low. Mm. From numbers I was working with at the point where I changed from edible to starting focusing much more on the soil farm we were anecdotally looking at data points and references of the food supply system in Guernsey and getting nods from the right people in the room to suggest we're pretty close to the to the numbers at least in broad strokes terms that something like 11 percent of the food consumed on Ireland was produced within the Channel Islands and something like seven percent of that was milk yeah and which, as we know, is subsidised or protected in, uh, for good reasons and uh, different conversations. But that means that 4% was the veg and the other. And recently in the news, we see Woodside Farms in Jersey that was responsible for 80%, I think, of locally produced food. Now, if my maths is right, that brings us down to not 4%, but like 08 Oh, one? A concerningly low level. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, the situation is obviously seemingly quickly deteriorated uh, in the past few months. Well, it means that we're massively reliant on import. Yes. And if we're not voting with that pound on what we're choosing through our food system, are we asking the question of where that... And this is one of the things I think is the most powerful way we can affect change as individuals... Are we asking the questions of where that food has come from, how it's grown, the environment in which it's grown? You know, we're, we're really powerful in choosing. I mean, if I keep voting for that, more of that will happen. The commercial pressures of that pound going in a certain direction will change systems. It always does. So if we're more diligent in uh, collectively and individually in asking that question, we can affect change. And if one of the things we want to see is more of that grown locally, we can put more pounds there too. And then the question then comes, where are your highest, what's high, higher on your list in terms of your tick boxes? Because ultimately that's where you, one arrives at is, are you buying for convenience and time or are you buying for local and regenerative and environment? Or, and how do you balance? Because, you know, it's not the only thing in our lives we have to attend to. So it's, it's the reality check part again but for me I'm more interested and this is a real challenge point actually I'm more focused on synthetic free organic high quality nutrient dense and I would love that to be local is it viable for Guernsey to have purely regenerative practices and increase our internal supply of food increase hundred absolutely we could do so much more than we do now. Achieve 100% of our needs. Well, the only way to answer that yes to that question is radical change in also in behavior, patterns, consumption, 
waste. With radical change, one could arguably, crunching mathematically, get close to that point. But from 1%, do we have headroom? Mm. <laughs> yeah, loads. So what if we set ourselves a target of 20% in the same way as we set a recycling target of, right, we've got to collectively get to 50% and we sailed past it. What if our target was 25% of food and not 1%? What if our target was 40 you know? And then we'd structured our questions and our systems to try and attend to that number. Then, yeah, I think there's loads of headroom. How quickly do you think this could be scaled up here? Well... Food is seasonal, right? It happens every year. <laughs> so you can make a dent of some description in a year, but you've got to then look at the the support and resourcing and um, backing for the individual going that route. It might be someone who's already managing land differently and needs to transition, and then there's a learning curve, perhaps a change in their tooling, perhaps a change in their approach. And collectively, if we're voting with that pound, there is some element of support, which I, I support that, that transition, but longer term subsidy, I think we'd be better without. And of course, there's sides to that. We could have a debate on that for, from different angles. But for me, there's, a, there's another point that you can find fairly easily if you Google other search engines available but if you ask that question I think the statistic shows that in the late 70s early 80s something like 25% of household income went out on food in terms of the way we assigned our income to food probably in part because if you look at that time frame as well there was a lot less of the big co commercial corporation involvement in food or that's how I remember it and my parents were involved in some businesses that gave us a little bit of the wholesale and the retail lens on that but certainly that's the number and today it's 11 so we've significantly reduced our household spend on food but I think the quality and the 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 nutrition and other things have gone with it and what we're buying is a lot more processed food a lot more convenient food a lot lower value for the same food and it's not you're a little test for you I hear it a lot because my lens is quite tuned to this because I'm so far down this wormhole. Walk around in the supermarket and you'll overhear without even listening in decision-making happening at the point of sale. And you'll see people buying a pack of bacon, let's say, that's pound fifty, And there's, as you know, there's 25 choices of bacon on the shelf there from the most expensive to the cheapest. And one of them will have a big red sticker on and it'll be two lots of bacon for the price and you'll see like there's a three pound for a farm reared considered Cotswolds or whatever it is bacon there that's and then there's a one pound fifty and that's six rashers and there's a one pound fifty for 12 rashers or 18 rashers and it's like oh look look at the value of that and that's the one that gets picked up and you've got to ask what is that pound voting for how was that pig produced at that price? What's the landscape impact of that? What's the environmental? What's the community impact? What's the farmer conditions? Is the farmer getting fair pay for that? Is he even able to survive on that? What are the conditions the pig was kept in? What, what are you voting for? And which is why I've arrived, uh, certainly not um, from a judgment perspective, but from a, a signing to a, a aligning to our own values, we can't make that choice anymore. It's that once you see, you can't unsee. And you don't have to look too far underneath the carpet to realise, actually, I can't vote for that from my perspective. So we, we choose less meat and go for the highest quality we can and then try and make a stock out of a chicken or so it goes for another meal or, you know, you get the main roast chicken and then you can make a curry out of it and a pasta out of it and then get a stock out of it and... You've paid £20 for the bird or £18 for the bird, not £3 for it. And now I can see how an £18 bird comes to arrive on a shelf at £18. I still don't understand how a bird arrives on a shelf at £3. I don't, I don't get it. Do you think that consumer habits would change if there was clearer 
understanding of the nutrient content of the food once it was grown. I heard recently there might be technology coming in where you could literally scan a tomato, get an exact reading on the nutrients. If that was on the label and people could see that the more expensive bacon, the more expensive tomatoes were far more nutritious than the others, that would affect where people vote with their pound? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big believer that you can't lead by fear. Um, we're not very good at responding to that, or we can be coerced for a period of time, but it never never sits well. So it has to be, I think, driven by values and opportunity and uh, other other things. And I, I agree with you, technology, whilst it's driven us in some ways in the wrong direction, or give, it has a huge opportunity here. And you're quite right. There's a, a measurement in food nutrient density called BRICS, B-R-I-X, which is essentially a, me a measure of naturally occurring sugars that have a direct measurable correlation to nutrient value. So by measuring the BRICS value of an item of food, you can tell the nutrient density of it. And funny enough, nature designed you with a set of taste buds that are doing the same job. And BRICS relates to flavour. So if you're biting into that tomato and it's bursting with flavour and you're having that explosion of flavour, you know, you go to Greece and you have the oregano and the sun-dried tomato off the hillside and you're like, when did I last have that experience with yeah. oregano that I got from the packet at home? It's not even the same product. Absolutely. Um, the flavour is telling you something. And it doesn't surprise me that nature designed you to filter your choices with this tool. Um, but BRICS is the technology answer to measuring the same thing. And I think you're right. My understanding is that there has been tests in a Canadian supermarket even where rather than measuring the sale of the value of the tomato by volume, it's by nutrient density. That would be a really interesting shift to have the value of the product measured by nutrient density. And I think you're right that the scanning technology is not complex. It's in mobile devices already for that to become ubiquitous in the phone so that without touching the product on the shelf, you can scan it and get a, a reading back of whether you... I think it would change how, how wouldn't it? And certainly if I had a qualification of why the price was different. Because mm. they're both red and round and look juicy. And one of them... I think there's also... A, my dad used to be really anti-organic, I think partly because organic food for him was just food. When he grew up, there wasn't the differentiation. And I think there was a mistrust in it's a tax, it's a levy on food. And I think having some qualification of what you're buying, they both look bright and red and shiny. They're both tomatoes. They're both plump. It's only when you bite into it, at which point you can't really give it back, <laughs> that mm. you realize it doesn't taste of anything and it's just pithy. Is it out of season? Is it the soil it's grown in wasn't able to transition the nutrient into the food? But at the point of purchase, you don't know this. Unless you start to realise, well, perhaps that mass-produced one that's got the different labelling and the packaging, why is it dressed up? Why is it trying to tell me that? And so the decision-making hierarchy of your engagement with it. And it's not easy, I have to say. I mean, it's been a, a salmon up, upstream kind of journey which is getting easier and easier, actually, because the market is slowly shifting. But there are lots of small questions that, when you use them frequently enough, they become embedded and you know instinctive, that you're not now asking all the questions, but there's still a couple of new ones that you <laughs> can't unsee um, that inform that decision-making process at point of purchase and where you go for the point of purchase. Um, and that's only ever a journey, and it's really you can't be on rung number twelve on the ladder and expect someone like me at uni to jump on rung twelve. You've got to find ways to onboard them onto rung one, and just ask those first questions. Or so the bricks reading smartphone app. I can't see how that's not going to help. Um, so I'd welcome that type of technology to give us that lens. Yeah, and I'd like to end. Just on a question, uh, what you just said is you don't think a fear-led campaign or a blame-led campaign really works or has purchase. So what is it that we can get excited about from regenerative farming, regenerative agriculture, the 
rejuvenation of the soil. What is the, the great story to tell? I think you've got to come back to the point that the humans, the people in the system, we're the consumer, we're the producer, we're the, and we're fairly sensitive and complex. And I don't think blame is a good motivator. I don't think fear is a good motivator. I say it works for a period of time, but it, it's not sustainable. And so trying to drive system, and I think there's also a, a, a marketing price pressure apathy we're, we're so busy and we've got so many choices to make in life that it's quite easy to be able to accept the convenience of one made for you and then there's this implied trust in systems isn't there of, of course then that guy creating that business and selling me that product's not out to do any harm surely but is it so we, there's this implied trust that we have to operate in systems because we can't deep dive in every single decision we make we just don't have the time or the resource so and the bigger our communities get outside of that 100 person or 10 person or 50 person the more we have to abstract trust and there's a great dialogue around how the financial system created that trust uh, trust in exchange with people we don't know um but coming back to the the point how does the where's the where's the opportunity well i think if you understand that we can't go the fear route, where's the opportunity route? Well, flavor is one of the places I'd start. If you look at how food's been used forever, it's about bringing people together, it's about celebration, it's about commiseration, it's about partying, it's about social gathering. You know, when was there ever a, a medieval tale without a feast banquet? <laughs> when was there ever a, a wedding or a funeral without the food? When was there ever a corporate gathering or a function or a family dinner or a Sunday roast or is, food is the center of community and it's a great way to bring people together so I think the more that flavor and values exist in that and actually if you watch people engage in in food when it's at its best it is a very different experience to consumption for convenience and the more that we can make that readily available and the norm without having to cost and here's all the challenges right this is why it's not just a, a switch on the wall that you flick and systems changed um, but if you if you look into the community and you ask the questions of the appetite excuse the pun but the the appetite for cleaner healthier locally produced food there the market is ready and waiting and actually, if you look at the growth of the organic section in Waitrose, for instance, it's not getting smaller year by year. People are voting, and I, I'm included, because it, whilst I love our heritage of hedge veg, and I support it entirely, there's no system that tells me what, how it was grown. And that tomato on the hedge veg down the road from me, was it peppered in aphid spray for its life and then on my shelf? I don't know. And so to some level of security and ticking the values boxes that I'm defining, that double wrapped plastic tomato, yeah, I don't like the plastic. I don't like the shipping. I don't like the fuel, but it is ticking some of the other boxes. And there is always these compromises and challenges in asking that. Um, I think we lead by, in fact, uh, turning the lens back around on myself. Sasha and I, in our work at the soil farm have been looking for the last two three four years since we really got past the first stages of our learning journey and started applying what we were doing have been looking for those farmers that we could work alongside to change the landscape and change the food landscape and really create that first blueprint of setting the bar showing what's possible and engaging people with food and having those flavor and local and all those experience and we're still looking and during covid things changed right although well, that's say covid during the lockdowns so, so we found ourselves looking in the mirror and realizing maybe we're looking at the agents of change maybe it's not looking for someone else to instill it and in. maybe we should get involved in producing some food and create that blueprint and we've been working really hard on the last year 
and more. I mean, all this whole journey's led to this, and there's been elements of it that are already long in place. I mean, I've got lots of experience of my own in running pigs and chickens and food production, but bringing all that together in a, in a meaningful proposal to say, actually, what if we set up a farm and created the blueprint? And that was the next stage of what we were doing, as well as helping others with their landscapes, but take the first step. And I think the rationale for that, besides all the points we talked about, about just come and taste the food, use it, experience it, have the community and the social elements around that. But what if we can use that to change that 1% to 1.1% or 1.01%. Someone's got to go through that first journey in a local context and prove that it's got all those value propositions. It's better for the environment in a local context. It's not that the, the evidence isn't there globally, but doing it locally, I think it's an important step. And getting through that first barrier to then open the way for others to, to de-risk it essentially, to show that you can make money doing this. You can live in Guernsey's high cost of living environment and do this. You can, And it's worth attending, attending to that point very briefly actually, that one of the biggest barriers I think in Guernsey particularly is that typically farmland comes with a big house on it, yep. the farmhouse. And the farmhouse is, is quite often viewed as the luxury living of the, you know, the investor or the finance or the and it's not price proportionate currently to the farmer. And when it is, it's a hard life to marry the two. And so there is an obstacle we have collectively to face and overcome in Guernsey to, to do, and, and if you're a farmer, our, our lens on this is that you've got to be on the land to be at your most efficient. You can't be commuting to an animal system. And, a, you know, there's too many details in the day to day. But we, we're a long way down the path of trying to solve that problem ourselves and come up with the, the workings to, to create that blueprint. Um, and if, anything, you know, if, there's, if there's people listening or reading that want to join that conversation, that's one of the areas where we're at. And I think from a really positive note, it's also worth stating that post-lockdowns, post-COVID, we've seen a huge upturn in inquiry for people looking from homeschooling families with three square meters in their back garden of food production that want us to come and help them make the values decision on that scale to private landscapes to food producers uh, there's not many of them but those that are there increasingly it's the question that's being asked um, and the more we support that with a pound the more we can look to change the systems that we're choosing. What a great point to end on. I'd like to thank you, Jock, for coming in today and for giving us your time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for having us. Thank you for listening to the Bailiwick Express podcast. The title track was Shift My Weight by Luno. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. And remember, you can always head to bailiwickexpress.com to stay right up to date with whatever is happening in the bailiwick. You can find us online, on social, on email, and on internet radio. There'll be more from me, Kit Hanna, and the Bailiwick Express news team next week.